This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. A boat with more than 70 migrants capsizes off the coast of Tunisia. Libyan migrants fired upon after fleeing airstrikes. And security forces expel 2,000 illegal miners from a cobalt mine in the DRC. Hello and a very warm welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. I'm Lindy Tongana in Nairobi. And with me is Panina Karibe with a preview of your business news. Thank you, Lindy. Coming up on Africa Live Business. Nigeria orders banks to loan more money to spur its struggling economy. And the Congo Republic will know in a matter of days whether its IMF bailout will be approved. I love details of those stories and plenty more in just a bit. For now, Lindy, back to you. Thank you so much, Panina. Well, we start the hour in Tunisia where dozens of migrants are feared dead after a boat carrying more than 70 migrants capsized off the coast of the country. Three people are said to have survived, but about 80 are still missing. Now, according to those survivors, the boat sunk off the coast of a Tunisian town known as Zarzis. Last month, at least 65 people drowned when their boat set off from Libya and sunk off the Tunisian coast. The shipwreck comes a day after a deadly airstrike on a Libyan detention center that has left at least 44 migrants dead. Well, let's get to you the very latest from Libya. Of course, the United Nations says it has information that government guards at the detention center that was attacked on Tuesday shot at migrants and refugees. The UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs also says the death toll from the airstrike could rise since bodies are still being retrieved from the rubble at Tajura Migrant Detention Center. Now, as Laura Wolobengo reports, UN Secretary General has, of course, condemned the attack. A report by the UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says there were two airstrikes on the Tadura Migrant Detention Center in Tripoli. The first attack hit a garage, while the second one hit a section where 120 migrants and refugees were being held. It is during the commotion, as refugees and migrants tried to flee, that guards are alleged to have shot them. Meanwhile, in Geneva, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has condemned the attack in which at least 53 migrants were killed. The Secretary General is outraged by reports that at least 44 migrants and refugees, including women and children, have been killed and more than 130 injured following airstrikes at the Tajura Migrant Detention Center east of Tripoli. He condemns this horrendous incident in the strongest terms and he expresses his deepest condolences to the families of the victims and wishes a quick recovery to those injured. The Secretary General calls for an independent investigation of the circumstances of this incident to ensure that the perpetrators are brought to justice. It is important to note that the United Nations had provided exact coordinates of the detention center to the parties. At the same time, he has called on the warring factions to stick to their obligation of protecting refugees and unarmed civilians as they battle for the control of Tripoli. The Secretary General further reminds all parties of their obligations under international humanitarian law to take all feasible precautions to avoid and in any event to minimize incidental loss of civilian life, injuries to civilians, and damage to civilian objects. And, he also, uh, and also to refrain from directing attacks against civilians. This incident underscores the urgency to provide all refugees and migrants with safe shelter until their asylum claims can be processed or they can be safely repatriated. The Secretary General reiterates his call for an immediate ceasefire in Libya and a return to the political dialogue. The airstrike on the migrant center came days after General Khalifa Haftar was involved in a spat with Turkey after his base in Garyan was overrun by government forces. Both Libya's National Army and the government have been trading blame over deaths of migrants and refugees at Tajura Migrant Detention Center. Laura Walubengo, CGTN. Well, CGTN's Adel al Makhri has been following the story for us from Egypt. He's now live with us from Cairo. 
Uh, Adele, of course, what this points to is just how vulnerable migrants are in Libya. But tell us, I mean, as far as we understand, uh, the UN is now saying that Libyan guards shot at migrants fleeing airstrikes. But what more can you share with us on exactly what happened on Tuesday? Uh, the United Nations says that um, th it has gotten reports about um, how the events unfolded, or at least um, how um, some of the casualties have taken place. Uh, and they believe once um, the air raids have begun, um, that has struck um, several parts, as we've heard in um, the previous report of um, the Tajura um, uh, Refugee Center, um, dozens have been trying to flee. And uh, while they were doing that, the guards um, uh, around that center have opened fire. This is according, of course, to the UN um, statement. Um, the exact details and um, the investigations that are, uh, or the UN has been calling for have not been yet um, announced about what exactly or how exactly has been unfolded. No investigations or questioning has been happened to the guards. Um, now the UN accuses of uh, hitting those um, migrants. But usually the, um, to give you just a general picture, there are about 110,000 refugees in Tripoli alone. Uh, about 3,400 of them live in refugee camps or refugee centers. Tajura is one of the biggest, actually. And uh, when um, the events unfolded, um, the UN is now challenged with um, re relocating some 500 other migrants in um, that center. Uh, and it's a big challenge, not just to unfold exactly how the events happen, but also to maintain the safety of refugees. The war over Tripoli is not just threatening um, uh, refugees in Libya, but also Libyan citizens, of course. And the recent attacks shows that the continuation of the civil war between the two rival uh, governments and forces is only causing more um, blood uh, shed among civilians and among uh, innocent people who are not directly involved in these mm. clashes. And Adele, is there any reason at all to believe that migrants may have been a deliberate target in this or any other attack in the middle of this ongoing conflict? There is no indication whatsoever, even um, the accusations. We uh, have seen uh, LNA forces uh, led by General Khalifa Haftar um, saying or confirming that they have been conducting, their air force have been conducting um, several strikes in a location near um, that um, refugee camp in Tajura. Uh, but they s confirm and they stress they have not um, hit um, the uh, refugee camp itself. And according to the LNA statement is that when the government of National Accord responded to their attacks, by mistake, they attacked um, the refugee camps. On the other hand, similar accusations come from the government of National Accord, who clearly have a statement accusing uh, Khalifa Haftar's forces, the LNA, of precisely attacking the refugee camps. We know for sure that both parties have been conducting airstrikes against the other. We know for a fact that some um, regional and international powers have been conducting airstrikes on the behalf of both rival armies. As um, the UN arms embargo continues, um, getting um, a lot of uh, air force for both parties have not been as accessible as the rest of um, the armory and the weapons that they have been getting from their supporting regional powers. And therefore, the airstrikes have been mainly, uh, or at least in most reports, have been confirmed to be part of other international powers who are trying to give advantage for one party in this Libyan conflict against the other. And on that note then, you know, as you, you've mentioned, both sides maintaining that they are not responsible for attacking migrants. Um, but when you mention perhaps other international groups, is there a sense that there are other key actors that we should be paying attention to in this conflict? I think this is what the UN uh, is trying to do at the current uh, time. It is, uh, has been trying to move firmly against anyone who uses or who violates the arms embargo in Libya. However, it has not been as strong to impose uh, a truce or to maintain or um, raise sanctions against any international uh, pa partner that has been um, trying to or ha is actually uh, violating the arms embargo. So that's one side, but uh, also the international intervention, it doesn't seem that the United Nations have been clearly pointing fingers at those active countries that are supporting both parties and violating the arms embargo, which is the main cause uh, for the death uh, casualties that we're seeing. So uh, whether it's di di 
excuse me, whether it's direct airstrikes from these uh, foreign countries or indirect support by breaking the arms embargo, there are international powers and international countries regionally and internationally that are involved and in one way or another could be connected to the airstrike that has hit and killed um, the uh, Libyan, uh, the, the migrants in Libya. Adel al Makhari, thank you so much for that informative update. Of course, we are following that story closely. Let's turn now to the DRC, where security forces have expelled an estimated 2,000 illegal miners from a cobalt mine. Now, the eviction comes just one week after a landslide at Komoto Copper Company mine killed 43 people. The miners at the Glencore Cobalt Mine had defied a deadline by the army to leave. The miners marched to the governor's office before being dispersed. Rights groups are noting that the expulsions fail to address the underlying issues of poverty and unemployment. The DRC produces more than half of the world's cobalt, a key component in several electronic devices. Well, we're now joined by CGTN's Chris Ochamringa. He has more on the story for us from Kinshasa. Uh, Chris, of course, uh, security forces are now, as we understand, uh, evicting illegal miners from the Glencore mine. Just update us on this process. Well, there was chaos in uh, Kolwezi City, <coughs> southeastern DRC today, as uh, after the police and the army evicted about 2,000 illegal miners from this uh, mine that's owned by Glencore. The people were very angry and uh, they marched to the office of the governor and uh, they were also dispersed by the police. And so there was looting and a lot of chaos in, uh, in Kolwezi city because of, of the eviction. The people are very, very annoyed that the only source of livelihood has been taken away from them. And so there's, there's a lot of tension. Right now the situation has calmed down, but uh, it's likely to be the start of uh, more protests uh, in uh, southeastern DRC. And tell us more about what is expected to happen in, in the days ahead. Of course, as we know, miners did defy a deadline last week to vacate the mine. But now with the army and the police having been brought in, uh, do you think that the miners will still uh, sort of show that, uh, that courage to defy further orders to be evicted? That's right. I mean, the miners saying it's, it's not yet over. They believe that you know, they're saying they are Congolese citizens and this, the, the minerals in this country are found in their land. Now, they, they're saying the foreigners uh, have st struck deals with the government, you know, to make lots of money, <clears throat> which doesn't trickle down to them. And so they're saying it's very unfair. First of all, their argument is that these concessions owned by these foreign uh, mining companies, I mean, the land is so huge and not all of it is being used for extracting minerals. So they're saying, look, we just want to get a little to, to feed our families. And so there's a lot of, you know, uh, frustration and anger among the people. And so there's, there's likely to be um, more, more trouble in, in Kolwezi City and other parts of Lualaba province in southeastern DRC. Well, certainly their perspective is valid, uh, especially when you're looking at issues like poverty and unemployment in the region. Is the government addressing this? Is there a plan to address some of these underlying issues that really are the driving force behind illegal mining? Oh, yes. Uh, the, 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 there is a plan. The DRC always has plans to, you know, to improve the lot of the ordinary people. But, you know, many times these plans only remain on paper. That's because of widespread corruption. Uh, the current, pre I mean, the new president, Felix Chisekedi, uh, said that one of the things that he's going to change in the DRC is, is, is corruption. He wants to dismantle all the corrupt uh, networks that have been in existence, you know, during the, the, reg the previous regimes. But he's facing a huge challenge. You know, he's, he's, he's caught up in these internal fights. He, he has uh, entered into a power sharing agreement with a coalition of uh, former President Joseph Kabila and many of those people want to see the status quo. I mean, they want the system to continue the way it is. So President Felix Chisakedi has some great ideas about transforming this country, putting systems in place, but you know, he has a very huge battle to, 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 to face and, and make 
those things come into a reality. So the Congolese people are just waiting to see. They're very eagerly waiting to see a new dawn in this country because they have had very many years of conflicts, conflicts, epidemics and suffering, no jobs. And so this is the time that they want to see a change in the country. Indeed, and as you say, ideas and plans are not enough. It's action that people really need to see. Thank you so much, Chris Ochambringa, joining us there uh, from Kinshasa. Let's move to Nigeria now, where at least two people are said to have died after a pipeline exploded. It is the second such incident this week following a fuel truck spillage that caught fire and claimed the lives of over 50 people. CGTN's Michael Kananja has the details. At least two people have been killed after a pipeline fire erupted in the Ijigun area of Lagos. This follows a similar incident that killed about 50 people earlier this week after a fuel truck spillage in the southeast caught fire. You can see all the whole shop along the Gota where the uh, product have passed through. All of them got born. Even people got born. Some are in the hospital now. People who are living in a residence, living inside, inside. About four poles away from here. Security agencies say oil bunkering activities caused a fire outbreak as fuel spilled into the community's drainage system. But it is pertinent to note that we are able to rescue 12 people alive. Four are now at last receiving treatment. And eight are being taken to the bonds unit at Bagada. But it is pathetic to know that in our preliminary investigations, we gathered that um, we have two mortalities but the operation is still ongoing by the time we finish the operation we'll be able to give you the comprehensive report such incidents are relatively common in one of africa's largest oil exporters while fuel is relatively cheap many live in extreme poverty in the country michael karanja cgtn Let's go to Tunisia now, where the government has set up a crisis unit to monitor the post-terror attack situation in the country and prevent any negative outcomes or impact, rather, on tourism. Now, the unit is in direct contact with the National Tourism Federation and international tour operators, as well as hoteliers, restaurants and tourist training schools. We've all assured that the influx of tourist groups to Tunisia continues normally and without any cancellations. Here's Adnan Chouachi with more. Tunisian authorities announced that the tourism sector is doing well. No booking cancellations, early departures or travel restrictions have been recorded following the latest terrorist attacks perpetrated on June 27 in Tunis. The last terrorist involved in last Thursday's bombing was neutralized. Terrorists were planning more attacks, but now the security situation is under control. The Ministry of Tourism is organizing a tourism exhibition near the bombing site. Over 5,000 visitors have attended the event. Tunisia tourism days have revived the main avenue in downtown Tunis. The activity is normal. Tunisians and foreign tourists are enjoying the atmosphere. We are not afraid. Professionals have welcomed the government's reaction and the crisis management. Tunisia is expecting over 9 million tourists this year, including 3 million visitors this summer. Tunisia recorded a 16.9% increase in tourists compared to the same period last year. Booking has reached 100% in the tourist resorts in Sousse, Jabar and Hamamet. These are very positive indicators. According to the Tunisian government, the tourism ministry ensures a permanent monitoring of the situation. A crisis unit was set up 10 minutes after the terror attacks. The crisis management unit is shared by the Minister of Tourism. It brings together a specialized team of the ministry, the tourism delegates of all the governorates, as well as representatives of the sector abroad. The Ministry of the Interior has taken all the necessary security measures to ensure a successful tourist season. Admin Shawichi, CGTN, Tunis. Rwandan President Paul Kagame says the crisis in Sudan will be up for discussion at the upcoming AU summit in Niamey. He also says the military council must take responsibility and protect civilians. Kagame was speaking to the press in Kigali. CGTN's Daniel Arapmoy reports. Pressure continues to mount on the military council to hand over to a civilian rule in Sudan. Protest organizers have called for more demonstrations until mid-month 
when a general strike will be held unless power is handed over to a civilian rule. Rwanda's President Paul Kagame, while addressing the press in Kigali, said the problem to address is how to steer the leadership vacuum back to the people who initiated the revolution for their benefit. Even if the, the, the military who are in charge, who, who, who took over, would be saying all kinds of things, it's up to them to convince the world that what they are doing is the interest of these very people there. And when you start seeing that they are being shot and killed and arrested, and uh, then you know something is going wrong. Tensions have continued to rise after a brutal crackdown on a long-standing protest camp in Khartoum killed dozens of demonstrators a month ago. Kagame says the Sudan crisis will be top on agenda when AU leaders meet in Niamey, Niger this month. If you have started going against these people who led this to happen, uh, then what are you actually doing? For who? Yes. So the, the, the AU will be raising these questions. In fact, the AU has been raising these questions. Sudan's protest leaders and ruling generals have now resumed talks over forming a new governing body, the first such negotiations since a deadly crackdown on demonstrators last month. Ethiopia and the AU have proposed a blueprint for a civilian majority body in a bid to resolve the crisis that has rocked Sudan for months. The military deposed longtime leader Omar al Bashir in April amid widespread protest against his iron fisted rule. Well, time now for a short break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. Rwanda marks its 25th liberation celebration since the end of the 1994 genocide. Algeria fears the rise of terror cells amid political uncertainty. The coast of Western Africa is a ticking time bomb. Along this coast, danger lurks in and around the beautiful blue waters of the Atlantic Ocean. You cannot stop children from exploring. You can tell them, don't go near the water body, that they will eventually go. Death by drowning is its name. When we talk about drowning, it's seldom mentioned. We don't really focus more on it, but it's a silent killer that needs to be addressed. Looking at drowning, why do people drown? What can we do to help people? from drowning, especially children. Millions of Rwandans across the country have celebrated Liberation Day, marking the day when the Rwandan Patriotic Army captured the country's capital, Kigali, and ended the 1994 genocide. This 4th of July marks the 25th Liberation Day in honor of the men and women who paid the ultimate sacrifice in fighting for Rwanda. CGTN's Daniel Arubmoy reports from the capital, Kigali. The 1994 Rwandan genocide left a haunting mark on the country's history. Whereas many thought the genocide would bring an end to the country's existence. July 4th has become a day for celebration. For some, it's a day of salvation. For others, a sign of hope. July 4th, 1994 was the day when the country's genocide reached its peak. With those who had survived months of ethnic cleansing, believing there was no hope. But the Rwandan Patriotic Front, under the leadership of President Paul Kagame, 
captured the country's capital, marking an end to mass ethnic cleansing. 25 seasons of mourning have passed since then. And with time, it is important to recall that the campaign against genocide became more than a military operation in the conventional sense. It became a rescue mission. In Rwanda today, the dark days are long gone. This day brings assurance in the future of Rwanda as countries top leadership and citizens alike reflect upon the progress made in the last 25 years of peace and security. With a growing economy backed by progressive President Paul Kagame, paving a way to a brighter future, the citizens of this East African country can only hope for a prosperous future. In his remarks, Rwandan President Paul Kagame said the main challenge now is how to sustain the achievements Rwanda has made in the last 25 years. All the energy that our people give every day to transforming the nation as we have seen in the past 25 years. As a result, the seemingly impossible has become manageable and even natural. Some of the African heads of state that grace the occasion include Emerson Mnangangwa, Mokwetsi Masisi, President of Botswana, President of the Central African Republic, among other dignitaries. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN, Kigali, Rwanda. And to Algeria now, where protests continue following a decision by the Constitutional Council to scrap a presidential election that was set for July 4th. This basically means that interim president Abdelkader Ben Salah could be in office for a while. However, there are fears that terror cells operating in the Maghreb region might take advantage of the current situation to gain root in the country. Here's Adnan Chouachi with more. According to Algeria's Constitutional Council, the presidential election, which was due to be held on Thursday, was not organized due to a lack of candidates who met the quorum of 60,000 signatures in support. Algerian analysts explain that the reasons for the deadlock are not only legal, but also political. In reality, the majority of public figures and potential candidates refuse to take part in the presidential elections on 4th of July. This is why the Constitutional Council could not find serious candidates who met even basic conditions. The public and the political boycott are the real reason for not holding the elections. Experts in Algerian affairs argue that interim President Abdel Qadr bin Salah could stay in power for months even after the 90-day transitional period which is guaranteed by the constitution. The constitution says Ben Salah should leave power by the end of his constitutional period to be replaced by an appointed president on authority to lead Algeria in the transitional period. Now the constitutional and military councils are using legal texts to impose Ben Salah's presidency after July 9th until the holding of unannounced presidential elections. Experts in Maghreb affairs assert that the instability and the political turmoil in Algeria will have a direct impact on the situation in Tunisia. Accordingly, the two North African countries have historically been tied up. Analysts argue that international terror cells could take advantage from the unrest in Algeria. Terrorist organizations are very active in the Tunisian-Algerian border regions in the south and the north. Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb is present in the mountainous areas in Gafsa, Kasserin, and Kef Governorate. The turmoil in Algeria is a relief for terrorist and armed groups. Protests continue in Algeria, where many people, especially youth, are seeking the departure of some politicians and businessmen who have been in power for decades. Abin Shawashi, CGTN, Tunis. Washington has resumed its military support to the Somali army after internal reforms made by the Somali government. The funding was suspended in December 2017 due to massive corruption in the security sector. From Mogadishu, here's CGTN's Abdulaziz Bello. 
The U.S. government says it will resume partial funding to non-mentored units of the Somali army more than a year after it suspended security assistance due to corruption concerns. Washington, Somalia's major security partner, says the pilot program will target security personnel trained to take over from the African Union troops in the lower Shabele region. Somali officials have welcomed the move and say recent reforms made within the army has created renewed confidence among its security partners. <laughs> The government has taken a bold move to create a biometric system that registers army personnel to ensure they are paid and receive their benefits on time. We want to ensure corruption free in the Somali army, and this is the only way to ensure it for the revival of security institutions. Analysts say the resumption of support means Washington will increase its aerial offensive against the group that has lost rural towns and villages in recent months to U.S. mentored troops. This will go a long way in boosting the fight against Al-Shabaab and ISIS. The funding cut affected the fight against terrorist groups, but now this will be a game changer, not just in battling the groups, but also strengthening the capacity of the army. In April, government troops from the Danap unit overpowered Al-Shabaab, seizing Sabit, Anole and Barire in southern Somalia. African Union says the capture of these towns by Danap will play an important role in the transition plan as Amisom draws down its troops from the country. There is tangible progress being made in preparing the Somali forces to take over. The troops, the Somali troops that are in Sabid are well trained, well equipped, well fed and with salaries paid. They are a new breed of uh, national forces, except that so far there are few battalions only. We need these to be repeated, that the security of this country depends on them. And a new security plan endorsed by the Somali government and backed by its international partners, Mogadishu hopes to have a strong, a capable force of 18,000 armed personnel backed by a police unit of 32,000 soldiers that will replace the African Union troops that have been operating here in the country for over a decade now. But until then, experts say Mogadishu will need increased assistance so as to end a decade-long armed insurgency that threatens the security of the entire region. Abdul Aziz below CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. And let's now go to Panina for your latest business news. Thank you, Lindy. Coming up in business. Nigeria orders banks to loan more money to spur its struggling economy. And the Congo Republic will know in a matter of days whether its IMF bailout will be approved. Nigeria is my home. 160 million vibrant, ambitious individuals constantly seeking the perfect self-expression. It is these people who inspired me to be that person that is seen, to be a voice that is heard, and ultimately to be the anchor that I am. I have to tap in, tune in, and turn on the very best qualities within me to deliver the news. I'm Richard Nta, an anchor for CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Nigeria's central bank has set a minimum loan-to-deposit ratio for commercial banks as it seeks to spur lending to stimulate the economy. All lenders in Africa's most populous country will be required to have a ratio of at least 60% by the end of September this year. According to the Apex Bank, those that fail to meet the threshold will have their cash reserve requirements increased, meaning they will be forced to park more money at the central bank. Nigeria's banks are some of the most reluctant lenders in major emerging markets, with an average ratio of below 60% compared with 78% across Africa. Meanwhile, in Congo, the International Monetary Fund's executive board is set to weigh a long-delayed bailout plan for the country on July 11th. The debt-laden country has been trying to secure a bailout since last year, but the international financier asked the government to curb rampant corruption and divulge the assets of high-level officials before providing it with any support. The Central African oil producer's economy has contracted for the past two years. Its debt-to-gross domestic product ratio is at about 110%. 
government. That's well above the 70% threshold allowed by the Economic and Monetary Community of Central Africa. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi has ratified the country's $95 billion budget for the fiscal year 2019-2020. It's targeting a 7.2% deficit and 6% GDP growth. Here's CGTN's Yasser Hakim explaining some of the key areas of focus of this year's Egyptian budget. The budget stands at $95 billion. The government continues its expenditure cuts by reducing subsidies on electricity and fuel for a fourth consecutive year. It's also digitizing all government procedures to cut on costs, while major natural gas discoveries have scrapped energy import bills. In the previous budget, the deficit was about 8.4% of the GDP. The new budget is targeting 7.4%. This will be achieved by reducing subsidies on petroleum products. As for public debt, there will be a ceiling on loans so that it doesn't exceed 90% of the GDP. Three or four years ago, the debt was over 100% of the GDP. According to the statement, revenue increases in 2019-2020 because of structural reforms in the tax collection system. There is a significant boost in two major sources of hard currency revenue, expat remittances and tourism. The visitor inflows have been increasing at an average 40% year-on-year in the last three years. Meanwhile, the economic reforms have created a budget surplus. This has allowed the government to dig into more social welfare services for the low-income earners. These subsidy cuts on energy have created the financial means to increase salaries, wages and pensions by over 15 percent. The saved money will also go into the new health care system, in education, as well as increasing subsidized food rations for the poor. Social welfare programs have a higher budget now. Regarding job creation, there is an ambitious target for unemployment rates to drop from 13.5 percent to 9 percent in the new fiscal year. The government is expanding its national projects and private investments. There are several mega projects in the pipeline, such as the city of Galala and the city of El Alamein. All these projects and the development of the Suez Canal and infrastructure work create a lot of jobs, and the new cities will open doors for future employment on a large scale. The government says it is targeting 6% economic growth rate in this fiscal year. But the government has moved to calm fears that for the first time in four years, it will not be imposing new taxes on Egyptians in its budget. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. The Center for Environmental Rights has released a report on eight large coal mining operations in South Africa's Mpumalanga. The report uncovers many cases of non-compliance with water use licenses. Angela Coppola has the story. The report by the Center for Environmental Rights, the CER, paints a picture of a Department of Water and Sanitation unable to monitor compliance or take action where needed. From the point of the issuance of a water use license to the point of monitoring and enforcement, the regulatory system has completely broken down. Um, and that regulatory system, not only in terms of how the Department of Water and Sanitation regulates and then oversees enforcement of water use license conditions, but also in relation to how companies take advantage of a rather opaque um, and dysfunctional regulatory space. The mining affected communities have been fighting with local authorities, government and mine management about water quality. Companies are not here to help us. They are here for their profits, we understand, but the government must play some role in terms of regulating them, in terms of monitoring them. And unfortunately these companies are not complying. Unfortunately government officials, some, most of them are corrupted. Most of them become directors of mining companies or mining operations after they've left the government. So this is the biggest challenge. But the South African coal mining sector is facing its own business challenges. Analysts say there will be a rapid decline in demand in the next 10 to 20 years. At the moment, weak quality coal goes to ESCOM and the higher grades are exported. We see the overseas markets uh, closing. The European markets have already basically closed. As a swing producer, South Africa was then able to move to China and India. 
I understand that uh, Chinese markets are also closing very quickly as the Chinese economy restructures. And there's a similar restructuring happening in India, although more slowly, where the coal contracts are now reserved mostly for the state coal companies. The CER report is evidence-based and will provide communities with the tools they need to fight for their rights. We really need to be able to find a way to translate what we have found in terms of quite detailed findings into information that is usable for communities, community organizations, so that they can challenge companies themselves. The findings of the report are damning when it comes to the Department of Water Affairs and Sanitation. It's now up to the compilers to mobilize the communities and other stakeholders so that they can take action themselves. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. China wants to increase its investment in Ethiopia as it targets to further expand its presence in Africa. Through its Belt and Road Initiative, the world's second largest economy has so far injected over $3.4 billion into Ethiopia, making it the biggest foreign investor in the country. With the details, here's CGTN's Koleta Wanjohi. The Eastern Industry Zone, 30 kilometers from Addis Ababa city, of the 103 companies here, over 80 are Chinese producing for the export market. Until the end of 2018, the Chinese direct investment registered in the Ethiopian Investment Commission have amounted to around 110 billion per, per with a total number over 1,357 uh, projects. But Chinese private investors want more support from the Ethiopian government. For the, uh, the laborers, they are skillful, really. We need to improve the skillful because, like for our park, you can see all the factory are very big one, and also the machine and everything is really very high model. We can export, but like depends like uh, the skillful of the workers. That means it depends of the product. If we can do the better product, we can export. Otherwise, you see. Other investors in the country include Indonesia, Malaysia, and Saudi Arabia. According to the World Bank, a slowdown in Ethiopia's economic growth since 2016 is partly due to slow industrial growth. That has been caused by lower construction due to foreign exchange shortages and the weaker performances of manufacturing and agricultural sectors. The government thus has initiated a private sector reform program, including improvements in the ease of doing business, liberalizing the country's investment laws and policies to ensure transparency and a wider participation of the private sector in the economy. China has been accused of using its economic power to influence policies in its favor in Africa, but it insists its investments benefit the countries in which they are made. This year, Ethiopia and China signed a $1.8 billion investment agreement. This will cover the provision of electric power transmission and distribution lines to 16 such industrial parks, the Ethiopia Djibouti Railway, and other cities in the country. Ethiopia has a large population that offers affordable labor and a market for manufactured goods, with the government making land available to investors and plans to liberalize some key sectors it hopes to open up further for inflow of more foreign investment. Coletta Anjoy, CGTN, in Dukem, Ethiopia. One of the major developments at this year's concluded G20 summit was a breakthrough in trade negotiations between the United States and China. China's Commerce Ministry has commented on America's decision to suspend new tariffs on Chinese goods. Let's take a listen. China thinks America's unilateral tariffs would hurt its enterprises and consumers, add uncertainty to the global economy, and even drag it into a recession. America's unilateral tariffs on Chinese goods were the starting point of our trade disputes. If both sides can reach a deal, it means all tariffs must be scrapped. China welcomes America's move of suspending new tariffs, which has prevented an escalation of tensions. We hope both sides can reach a win-win solution based on the two leaders' consensus and on the basis of equality and mutual respect. It will create stability for enterprises of both countries and the rest of the world as well as a predictable environment for trade and investment. That's it for now on Africa Live Business. But later on on Global Business, the much-anticipated NSE derivatives market is now trading, bringing with it new opportunities to local and international investors. We shall have more on that at the top of the hour. For now, Lindy, back to you. Thanks, Felina. Well, let's take a short break. Here's what's still ahead on Africa Live. 
Coming up, Imagination Africa highlights the importance of play in childhood development in Senegal. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Uh. Oh. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference.